Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. Back at home, my son was supposed to be cutting his grandmother, my mom's lawn, as a favor for me while I was gone. The day he was supposed to cut it, he called me and asked me had I ever seen anything over there. I told him I hadn't, but his sister had before. He said, well, I started cutting where we always plant corn for the hogs. I started feeling watched, but I didn't think anything about it. Then, feeling watched turned into that get out of your feeling. So, I started looking towards the wood. I saw something very dark behind a big pine. I wasn't sure if it was anything or not, but then it peeked its head out from behind the tree, and I realized what it was. It would peek out and then hide back behind the tree. I finally figured out what I first saw was its arm. I didn't get a good look at its face because it would only peek out far enough, so just only a little bit of its face was not hidden. Anyway, I'm not cutting that part of Nan's grass. That was my son's July experience. The next week, I was back home. My wife, my daughter and I were outside. My daughter was brushing one of the dogs while my wife and I were relaxing on the rockers on the front porch, talking about God knows what. I suddenly noticed our daughter was staring intently into the woods. I called out to her and asked what she was looking at. I hear a weird clicking sound, she replied. Curious as to what it could be, I got up and walked towards her. Her gaze was fixed hard on the wood as she strained to find the source. Anything, I asked? No, she answered. I got up next to her and asked where the sound was coming from. She pointed toward a large old oak about ten or so feet inside the wood line. I don't hear nothing, I said. I heard it, Daddy, I swear, she replied. I stared hard, too, but I couldn't see anything but shadows. With my curiosity piked, I headed toward the wood line. I stopped, feet from it, when I heard the clicking sound my daughter had mentioned hearing. I didn't know what to make of it, and scanned the woods. I was looking for answers. I don't see anything. I was about to take another step. When my daughter howled in fear. I see it. I see it. Where? I asked. My eyes scanning, but unable to fix on anything definitive. The big oak, it's right there. It popped its head out for a second. I looked at the big oak, but couldn't make out a head. All I saw were shadows. Then the shadow moved. I didn't know what I was looking at at first, but then it moved into a part of the woods where some daylight was peeking through the thick canopy. I could hear my wife hollering at me now. When it passed through the light, I made out a large bipedal being. It must have been seven feet tall, with broad shoulders and thick, blackish-brown hair. The hair appeared to be matted down with dirt and leaves, and I even made out twigs sticking out of it. A tinge of fear mixed with genuine curiosity raced through me. I felt an urge to flee, but I also couldn't stop staring at the thing as it made its way away from me. My daughter kept screaming, as did my wife, but their voices had become distant due to my fixation on the creature. I stood and watched it until it disappeared further into the thick dark woods. Comfortable, it was gone. I stepped back from the tree line and headed back toward my house. The evening was spent 
talking about the creature, with me and my daughter reciting what we'd witnessed, while my wife kept trying to convince us we hadn't seen anything but a bear. Bear or Bigfoot? I know I did see something, but I still swear I saw a Bigfoot. Not a day after the incident did I not find myself staring into the woods and wondering if the creature was still there. I'll admit that I'd love to see one again, but it's been three years now since, and still nothing. But, who knows, those things hide well, and I'm sure they're still out there. On to the next one. My wife, daughter, and I when camping over the holiday weekend. We both took off work Friday and headed off to meet up with a group of friends who were camping with their kids and dogs for the holiday weekend. They were already out there and had found a nice campsite that was big enough for our group. The campsite was just off a service road and was secluded from anyone else because where we were wasn't at an official campground. In total, there were ten of us, seven adults, and three tweens. We were camping out in an area south of Mount Rainier, just outside the Park Bounty, off a service road that, if you drove down it, would lead you to a locked gate that enters the park. We knew at the end of the road was a locked gate because all the cars that went that way eventually came back because it was only accessible to National Park staff. We set up camp in a flat area that fit two large tents and built a primitive fire pit so we'd be able to enjoy the warm flames and to cook from. With the campsite set up for the weekend, we set out to enjoy ourselves and relax. It was nice to just be with friends, having drinks around the fire, laughing and catching up. We stayed up late, but soon the weariness of the day started to catch up along with the chilly air. Slowly, everyone faded off to their tents and to bed. My wife had gotten chilled, so she went to warm up in the car where she fell asleep leaving my daughter and me as the last people awake. But not long after, she followed my wife to the car to get warm. But before she did, I escorted her to her tent to get a blanket, then took her to the car. After a bit of time at the fire, drinking and thinking, I went back to the car because I didn't want both of them to sleep there. But my wife wouldn't budge. She wanted to sleep in the car, and my daughter was out cold. I insisted she at least turn off the engine. She agreed to that request. I laughed and took the wind. Not tired, I went back to the fire. I worked hard and needed this break from the world. So, I was planning to soak it up as much as possible. I cracked open another beer relaxed in the chair and watched the flames dance in the fire. My mind spun with all that was happening in my life. Mostly good, but some typical stressors we all go through as an adult. Somewhere around thinking about how I was going to handle a difficult client, I must have dozed off because I woke to find the once roaring fire now embers. I stretched, got up, and headed for the tent. As I navigated through the pitch black campsite, hoping I wouldn't trip over anything, I heard some branches snapping far off in the woods. I didn't think too much of it. I was in the middle of nowhere and no doubt surrounded by all types of wildlife. I nestled into my sleeping bag, and before I knew it, I was asleep. I woke suddenly to the distinct sound of my daughter's tent rustling. I looked at my watch and saw it was 3.37 in the morning. I then heard two 
female voices talking softly. I listened intently, trying to hear what they were saying, but I couldn't really understand anything. There were no real discernible words coming out, just mumbling. Then, silence. I figured it was just my wife and daughter finding their way to my daughter's tent after discovering that sleeping in the car wasn't as comfortable as they'd imagined it would be. I tried to go back to sleep, but now found myself wide awake, and to be honest, my back hurt as my mattress was flat. As I lay there in what I can only describe as dead silence, I heard branches breaking and snapping not far off, like just outside the campsite. Then I heard something moving around toward the front of my tent, and it stopped. Something was directly outside the front of my tent. I could feel it and sense it, so I slowly rose to a seated position and heard something breathe in and exhale a large breath. This was the heaviest breath I've ever heard, and it was followed by what I can only describe as a very loud huff, as if from a horse or cow or some very large mammal. I sat there, frozen with fear, trying to rationalize what it was I was hearing, when it suddenly stopped. It was eerily silent now, which I found scary, as I knew I'd heard something breathing outside my tent. And now nothing? None of this made sense. I sat there, frozen with fear for what seemed like forever, until I could tell the sun was coming up and that it was light out now. I mustered up the courage and went outside and checked the ground in front of my tent, and that was when I noticed my daughter's tent was unzipped and empty. I panicked and rushed to the car to find them found asleep. I was confused. Was I dreaming? I began to look around for tracks, but couldn't find a single track. Nothing was around our tent, and all seemed to be in place. I was stressing now. Who did I hear talking? Who was sulking around the tent? What the heck was that breathing in front of me and the huffing outside my tent? What opened my daughter's tent zipper? Surely there was an explanation. I went to the fire pit and sat down. An hour passed as I got the fire up and processed exactly what I had experienced. Slowly, everyone began to wake and make their way to the fire pit. It's sort of the morning march or ritual when camping, head to the fire. When my friends sat down, I asked where their dogs were. Surely their dogs would have heard something, or maybe it had been their dogs sniffing around the tent. The answer I got from them was blunt and honest. Their dogs had been in their tent with them. None were out all night. I was at a loss for words. What could have been talking? It had sounded like two women. And what about the heavy breathing? I knew I didn't make this up. I wasn't hallucinating or dreaming. I knew what I'd heard. And finally, who or what opened my daughter's tent? I clearly remembered her zipping it up when she got her blanket. I was there with her. I saw it. Fear gripped me. And what was especially terrifying to think about was that breath and the huffing outside my tent. It was literally one of the scariest moments of my life because something large and unknown had been standing just feet from me. And the only thing between me and it was my flimsy tent. I had to put away my fear because if I didn't, I'd ruin the trip for everyone. So... I kept what had happened to myself and decided to act like all was good. The rest of the day went by fine. We had breakfast, then headed into town, then came back and went for a hike 
around a lake that was close by. As the day gave way to the early evening, my fear began to reemerge. Was that thing watching me or my family? Would it come back again? And if it did, would it harm me and my family? I got the fire roaring in anticipation for the darkness that would soon envelop us, and was about to relax in a chair when a loud whoop came from far in the woods. We all looked at each other. My friend asked, what was that? I didn't answer. Honestly, because to do so would have either scared them or they think I was crazy. A few more whoops followed the initial one and then silence. Minutes went by and nothing. We went back to our random conversation. What light was left of the day finally disappeared, leaving us with the glow of the fire and our shadows dancing off the trees. All seemed like normal when a blood-curdling scream came from the woods. But this time, the cry wasn't far at all. In fact, it sounded like it was fairly close by. The scream silenced all of us. Everyone looking at each other, hoping someone would say something that would give an explanation for the scream. Dad, what was that? My daughter asked. I didn't know how to respond. It was my job to protect my family. And if I told them, I thought it was some sort of monster. And that monster had come by the campsite last night. Well, we'd be heading home without further delay. More screams echoed from close by, sending gripping fear through us all. Wood knocks now came, along with a series of howls. All of us were still silent, mainly out of fear. I looked over at my good friend, who also happened to be a former infantryman in the army, and asked if we should go investigate. He said it was best if we just stayed put, as the second we went looking for something or someone, we had a disadvantage, and they could just hide and ambush us. This was smart and we heeded his advice. He looked at the frightened and unnerved group and said, It's a fox. I've heard them make those noises before. I knew he was lying, but what else were we going to do? Get everyone panicked and cause a small stampede to our cars and race off? Loud wood knocking could now be heard. It was closer, and everyone in the camp was getting freaked out. My wife then suggested that if it wasn't a fox, it was someone having fun with us and to ignore it. I nodded in agreement. What she was doing was removing the fear for the kids. The more us adults played into the idea that something weird was out there, the more the kids especially got scared. I turned toward the group, clapped my hands together, and asked with a smile who wanted s'mores. We set to having fun, even though we could hear wood knocks and occasional whoops. Soon, the sound stopped, as if we were all in a state of denial. We just ignored what we'd heard and enjoyed the rest of the night. When the time came to go to bed, I made sure we all slept in the same tent. This time, I came armed with pepper spray and a flashlight, if need be. I lay there, listening intently for any footfalls or branches breaking, but heard nothing. I'm not sure when I drifted off, but when I did, and when I woke, it was morning and the sun was up. I immediately unzipped the tent and exited to find all looked normal. I did walk around, but found no evidence anyone had entered the camp. Then again... I'm not some expert tracker who can see a depression in the leaves and know what they had for breakfast. So everyone else woke, and like me, I saw them looking around, half expecting to see something out of place. We all gathered for breakfast, and soon afterwards packed up and left. Three years have passed since, and we haven't been back, nor have we gone camping. 
We don't really talk about what we experienced, but our inability to want to go camping again says it all. I do still wonder what was out there, what screamed and made those strange noises. I suppose I'll never know for sure, but something tells me we had an encounter with a Bigfoot. On to the next one. Growing up in Oregon, I never gave much thought to the stories my classmates brought to school, and our teachers had a firm rule against discussing any stories related to Sasquatch and Bigfoot. We had been indoctrinated from an early age that these creatures were never to be discussed, as it would cause people from the rest of America to move to Oregon, and our parents would no longer be able to live here due to overcrowding. I wonder now if all the teachers in our state also created this fear. Beginning at so young an age, we all just naturally kept our family secrets to ourselves, at least as far as teachers were concerned. I guess it's not any different than hiding family embarrassments from others. So I never thought a whole lot about it. That is, until it happened to me. My mother was a teacher at our local school, so... I had to be especially careful about discussions around the dinner table, lest I annoy my very opinionated mother. We had many Sasquatch believers in our extended family, so I had a lot of secrets to keep, and even though I was unfamiliar with them, I was taught to accept them as I would any living creature that I knew lived around the area. Even though there were many species I had never seen as it was with Sasquatch so far at the time. Our community was no different from the others in this wildly beautiful country, and we were very protective of our lifestyle. And our secret animal was very protected by a population who had no desire to attract visitors searching our mountains. Our adult population seemed to be totally against increasing our population, and they always made references to not being like California. This long lead-in will perhaps explain why my grandfather had been able to keep his secret from all of our extended family and how I came to be the only one besides my grandmother to learn of it. I had just graduated from high school and I was planning to enjoy one final summer vacation before going into the military. Grandfather came by the house to invite me to spend the week with him at his and grandmother's cabin near the Illinois River, near where it joins the famous Rogue River to make its way to the Pacific Ocean. I felt very honored that he had invited me because none of my cousins have ever been invited to even see the property, and here was my chance to spend an entire week. Grandmother had been feeling poorly for a while, so she declined to come along to what she called the woods. So, with my bags packed with hiking clothes, I couldn't wait. Even the discomfort of Grandfather's old Jeep Wrangler on the seemingly neglected country road was pleasure to me. The county rarely maintained this dead-end stretch of the loneliest section of the wild corner of where almost no one lived. Grandfather's only neighbors was a crusty old bachelor who had a whole line of keep-out signs all along his property. And since Grandfather's land was the last place on the road, no one probably realized there was even a house there, as he didn't even have mail delivery due to the inconvenience of having to check both locations, here and in town. So, here we were, after a lot of bouncing in the Jeep that Grandfather must have forgotten had any brakes as he never thought to slow down for bumps in the poorly maintained road. I had the duty of unlocking the huge gate, and after Grandfather passed through, I closed and locked it behind us. The cabin sat in the back of the forest of pine trees that Grandfather had planted when he first bought it and had just built the house. Once parked by the back door, the jeep was totally hidden from the road, and even the smoke from the fireplace took a route behind the hill to the Illinois River 
only a quarter mile away. I had stayed here a few times in the past, so I had been more than a little excited about this trip. As we sat on the picnic table, after wiping off a month's supply of pine needles and relaxing with cokes, Grandfather grew serious, and he consciously lowered his voice as he leaned forward and looked directly at the spot between my eyes. He asked, What do you know about Sasquatch? I was shocked by the seriousness and the manner in which he asked, and I stammered to reply that I knew what they were when he continued without warning for my reply, saying that he had allowed a family of them to live on his property and had for many years. Then he began a more casual tone as he went into great detail about how they had first made contact and his long process of leaving various food for them and pretty much of a history dating back to when he and grandmother first had the cabin built and how it took several years before my grandmother dared go with him to what he called their hideout. He explained that he had still never told grandmother about the Sasquatch because she would have refused to ever return. I sat enthralled with the stories of his experiences and the thought entered my mind as to why he had never before brought up the subject, even those times when I had stayed here for a couple of days at a time. Without me even having to ask, Grandfather explained that his friends were too precious to take any chances with their security. So he waited until he felt I had matured to disclose his precious secret. I had a feeling of great pride that in the eyes of such a wise and respected retired county judge now considered me with the respect of his trust. He told me that he was going to teach me two secrets that only he knew, and I would be expected to keep everything confidential and reveal the information to no one else. As he spoke, he reached into the canvas bag he had nonchalantly placed beside him when we first sat down and pulled out a quart-sized mason jar and set it before me on the table. It was full of gold. I picked it up, and I was amazed at how heavy it was. I could barely heft it chest high to stare at the contents. Grandfather then told me that no one besides the two of us now knew the secret that he had successfully kept from everyone. And after he had discovered the gold source accidentally while fishing, he had purchased the land and built the cabin. Although Grandmother had never gone near the river because of her hatred of mosquitoes, she had enjoyed her time spent here. Grandfather explained that there was no way to file a gold claim as the government had banned any more mining claims years before. Also, in order to sell his gold with no questions asked, his friend and fishing buddy, who also panned gold nearby, set up a contact with a source in California's black market, and this was their way of selling the gold without any records. Grandfather said that this source also paid a lot more for larger nuggets that could be made into jewelry, which was all the more reason to deal out of the area, so no jealous rival would turn him to the authorities. At first, I thought their main reason may have been to avoid paying taxes, because finding gold is not illegal, and when I questioned him on that, Grandfather was quick to point out that it had been necessary to keep every association with gold discovery totally hidden, as there were still cases on the books of missing persons who had discovered gold, and after selling it through regular means and paying the state and federal taxes, they had suddenly disappeared. He said people who would never have even considered being crooked would do strange things for a gold claim. Then I could understand. As I had always heard from a friend whose father worked in law enforcement that Oregon has a higher number of missing persons on the recorded books, some dating way back to the 1800s where men just vanished. That happened quite often to newcomers. I had to smile when I thought back to those dinner table discussions my parents had over the years where they expressed concerns about my grandparents maybe being heavily in debt and how they may have to step in to help financially if either of them became sick. Thinking back to those discussions, 
I had to grin, and I had done so suspiciously as Grandfather caught me, so I had to explain. I think he laughed for the rest of the day, because even once in a while he snickered, just thinking about it. Then he told me in confidence that my folks would really be shocked if they knew the huge sum of money they stood to inherit. I remember how I heard them worrying when he bought the new Cadillac and then the Jeep. I bet they would be really shocked at the brand new four-wheel drive, three-quarter ton pickup that he had kept in the garage that still had the window sticker on it. I chuckled aloud at the secret only Grandfather and I knew. Then Grandfather grew really serious as he leaned forward and began speaking in a lower tone as if there was a chance of being overheard, and at first I thought he was doing it for show. However, he was very sincere when he reminded me of a time when I had been in the garage on one of my stays with he and grandmother. He had sent me to the garage for a can of assorted nails, and there were two identical cans, so I opened them both, and one had a pint-sized glass jar full of gold. When I brought out the nails, I asked grandfather if it was really gold, and he said it was, and then swore me to secrecy. As he again spoke, he confessed that finding that gold so long ago was no accident, and, in fact, that had been a test to see if I could keep a secret, and he apologized for doing that, but he said it was extremely important that I pass, because now he was going to show me the most important secret of all, a secret that I had to swear to keep as long as he was alive, and only after he was gone, I could tell anyone about what he was about to share with me. Grandfather then began a short critique of the state and how they put giant steel gates across every public access road and how they treat the public lands as if it was their personal property by randomly closing these beautiful forests to all comers. He said they claim it's to prevent forest fires, but he felt it was just their way of cutting their workload so they could spend more time sitting around and drawing their paycheck by filing phony reports, so with mountains full of gold, that recreational miners would enjoy finding and earning a few dollars from, they selfishly let it lie. I listened without speaking, and with the occasional nod, Grandfather unloaded his frustrations, and it sounded familiar because my friend's father had often spoken about similar disappointments as living in gold country without being able to even pan a small amount is certainly a disappointment. I sat enthralled by stories of grandfather's mining friends who held original grandfathered gold claims, who didn't even dare go into town for supplies because if they left their claims unguarded, the state people would sneak in and burn their cabins and dynamite their claims. And when he finally leaned back and realized that perhaps he needed to mellow out, I had a clear understanding of why he had kept this secret so well. I had heard a similar story from my high school coach whose father had owned a mine. Grandfather got back to why he had felt it so important that I understood his reasons for secrecy, and then he began telling me about the secret source of his gold, and why he had felt it was time that he included someone he could trust to carry on profiting from his find after he was gone. He must have noticed my furled brow because he quickly assured me that he was in good health, but he felt better having a partner. I swelled with pride as he placed the jar of gold back in its hiding place, handed me a backpack, shouldered an even larger one, and making sure the cabin and garage were locked, he strapped on a shell belt and holster containing his magnum revolver and we started walking into the thick forest behind the garage. Exiting through a small gate, he closed it behind us, and within minutes, all signs of civilization were gone. Not even airplanes passed over this area, unless from a small coastal town, so in only a few minutes, we were in a different world. As we walked at a steady pace on the well-traveled animal trail, Grandfather reminisced about when he and his friend had first discovered this gold, and he again told me how sad it was when his longtime pal had suffered that fatal heart attack, and he had no living relatives, so grandfather had handled all funeral arrangements. 
I vaguely remembered hearing about it from my folks' conversations. As we continued meandering on this trail, the sound of the Illinois River was becoming louder, and it was soon impossible to carry on a conversation without raising our voices, which we did not wish to attempt, lest we should be overheard. Walking quietly in the forest is a most enjoyable experience. The sounds of the river were quietly diminished now, and Grandfather explained that it was now on a direct course to where it would soon flow to the famous Rogue River that was only a few miles from here. This was such a treacherous section of the Illinois River that Grandfather said you could be standing on the shore and very seldom would you ever be noticed by a single rafter, as at this point they would be totally concentrating on staying alive. All of a sudden, as if to prove his point, we heard a mingling of shouts and screams, and around the bend came a huge rubber raft that swayed violently through the churning and frothing white water, and it was a wonder that the rope they had around them could have kept them seated as the four people paddled in desperation with the huge raft raised up almost perpendicular to the ground as they finally passed through the rough rapid. And then the river ran straight for another fifty yards, then curved sharply to the left, and the shouting commenced once more as they disappeared around the bend. Grandfather pointed out the fact that not one of the four had even glanced our way, and at that point he stopped abruptly and turned toward the cliff that loomed high above our left side, and without a word he grabbed hold of an old rotting snag that I thought was rooted to the sand beneath it, but it came away easily to reveal a very narrow crack in the wall of the cliff. Without a word, Grandfather motioned for me to enter, and then, when we were inside, tossed a handful of dry sand at the base, so it once again looked as if it was rooted there. Within a few feet, the narrow slot widened into a sort of shoulder-level passageway that the smooth side indicated an ancient lava flow that Grandfather said had passed through this area and left a myriad of these rocky rivulets that all seemed to feed into the Illinois and Rogue Rivers. In the very center of this short-walled slot ran a stream that was crystal clear, and a bottom of which was gravel and smaller rocks that the centuries had worn smooth. And I could see many pieces of what looked like obsidian and crystals, and then, at the wider spot around the slight bend, Grandfather stopped suddenly and removed his pack indicating with a nod for me to follow suit. Placing my pack beside his, I watched as he withdrew a well-concealed bag, and from the waterproof rubber container, he withdrew two small folding army shovels and two black plastic pans that I instantly recognized were for panning gold because of the built-in ridges. In only a couple of minutes, I had learned the art of proper panning for gold. I knelt there staring at several tiny specks of gold amidst the fine black sand that covered the bottom of my pan. Then, Grandfather seemed pleased that I had mastered the art so quickly, opened up his pack, and brought out our lunch. There we sat on opposite sides of the small stream, enjoying the sun that was chasing away the chill of the morning. And then, Grandfather told me the story of how he and his best friend had accidentally stumbled onto this hidden slot when they were fishing from the bank when a storm suddenly rolled in. He said it had rained so hard that they had wedged themselves up close to the bank when the old dead tree broke off at the bottom to reveal the narrow slot canyon behind it, and they slipped around it as it was still connected by root. As they sheltered in the protection of the walls where we now sat, his partner had noticed a gold glint when the sun finally took control of the weather and that caused them to become instant gold miners. Grandfather made me swear an oath to never reveal to anyone what we shared while he was alive, which I proudly swore to. Next, something happened that almost scared me so badly I felt silly like a girl afterward. There came a sort of a shriek, like the monkeys in the Tarzan movies made, and it was loud enough that I suddenly lurched back and hit my head on the rock wall when Grandfather held up his hand and put a finger to his lips to caution me, and he nodded as if to say, all right. Then, as he withdrew a large plastic-wrapped package from his pack, my curiosity was answered as to why he shouldered such an oversized pack. 
he placed the large and apparently heavy package on a place on a high ridge above him, and then sat back down and once again gave me the sign to remain silent. Then I felt like the first time I saw the movie King Kong, as this giant fur-covered creature suddenly loomed directly above Grandfather's head, and Grandfather turned slightly to acknowledge the giant Sasquatch without getting to his feet, and the huge creature then looked at me, and then it seemed to furl its brow as it looked back at Grandfather. Grandfather returned its curious stare with a nod, and he pointed his open hand at me, then back at his chest once more, and the Sasquatch then nodded his head at Grandfather, and then looked at me once again. He repeated the nod, to which I took as a hint and also nodded in return. Somehow, this seemed to me as an introduction and a sort of acceptance by the big animal that, as Grandfather later told me, he was depending on me to continue this strange friendship after he was gone. I readily agreed that I would gladly do so, and then he told me that he would give me a written list of what goodies I should bring, and what times of the year, and then he shocked me into open mouth silence by his next statement. He said that he had invited me as a test to confirm a major decision he had made, and then he really gave me a jolt. Grandfather said in the next few days he was planning to file and record his will, and in it I was listed to be the sole recipient of his cabin and all possessions on the property. He said he had discussed this decision with Grandmother, since she would never come here without him, and she was in total agreement. I went through the mental shock and the emotions that I guessed were natural in such circumstances, and he explained that this was not as big a gift as it may seem, because he was dead serious that above all else, his Sasquatch friends must be taken care of. So now, I guess my future had been pretty much decided. As from Grandfather's note and the sources he will soon be introducing me to for selling me my gold, Grandfather and I will be working together around the cabin and, at times, working our gold claim. But I will continue living my life, and he will hopefully live a long time. But what an exciting future I will have. Wait until my parents find out I have planned my future without their help. The only thing I'll need is a regular job as well. The one other thing that we agreed on is I will be present on all future trips to the Sasquatch family, which are most frequent in the summer months. And as yet, Grandfather is still not certain if they hibernate, but he seldom sees them in the midwinter months, but he has trouble at that time of year due to the sporadic snows. So he said that so far he had not heard any objection from the Sasquatch. Then he laughed loudly and it was quite a funny thought at that. On to the next one. Near Boyle in Alberta. I was 14 years old at the time and staying with family and their friends at my mother's family homestead farm in northern Alberta, very close to North Buck Lake. Everyone regularly goes fishing at what is commonly known in the area as the Narrows, a tiny connection between two major sections of North Buck Lake as fish there are in abundance. My friend and me decided to return to the farm on his dirt bike ahead of everyone else. About two-thirds of the way back, there's a long straightaway where you either return to another part of the same lake or make a hard right turn which takes you to the farm, which is at least two miles further. As we turn the corner leading back, I immediately noticed a person walking in the road far off in the distance, a mile or so. As we approached it, it appeared darker and more massive. I became more apprehensive and couldn't get my friend's attention as the noise from the dirt bike drowned out my voice, but I still didn't think anything other than someone walking in the middle of the road until we neared the turn to the farm. What really frightened me was just before the turn back to the farm, after the long straightaway, my friend stopped the motorcycle and didn't say a word. I tapped him on the back and said, do you see that? He replied, yeah, what the bleep is it? I then saw this creature act like it sensed or knew it had been spotted because it crouched down for a few seconds then scurried off into the ditch, then the brush, 
Until that moment, I was convinced it was a person. But the manner that it retreated in was so animal in nature, and I had just watched it walk upright for more than a minute, probably two. I just about fainted. My friend freaked and cranked the bike, almost tossing me off the back. As soon as we got back to the farm, we built a huge bonfire and pulled out all the guns, only 22s. The strange thing is that we didn't talk about what we saw, but just acted together, knowing we couldn't explain it. There were many old stories from farmers through word of mouth. I found a couple of articles from the Athabasca paper of sightings and tracks near the town and the Athabasca River. It was between 6 to 7 p.m., clear and sunny. The area was known for lots of black bear and blueberries and sand hills. On to the next one. In Morley, in Alberta, it was clear, sunny, and warm. It was late evening. My brother, cousin, and two sisters and myself were playing baseball in a clearing near our house. Our game was interrupted by a loud scream. It sounded like a siren and ended in a growl. We all froze in our tracks and tried to figure out what it was that we had just heard. Then another scream was heard. We immediately dropped our gloves and bat and ran for home. The screaming continued until we ran inside the house. We don't know how much longer it screamed afterward. Whatever it was, it was not an animal that we have heard before. The sound itself petrified us on the spot. We were playing baseball in a recently made clearing by a bulldozer in the woods. Stories of that nature are common in our community. It was around 4 to 6 p.m. It was a nice warm day. The sun was out. It's in the foothills with dense poplar and spruce trees. On to the next one. In the Jasper National Park near Jasper in Alberta. I didn't see a creature, but did see some very clear tracks that obliquely crossed the mud of the North Boundary Trail in Jasper National Park. I was on a solo backpacking trip into the North Boundary Country, and I had been hiking for about a week and had not seen anyone in this time except for mule deer, grizzly bears, wapiti, and many small animals. It was very early in the season, and I was likely the first person to be on the trail that year, as I had seen no signs of people previous to me, not even any evidence of anyone through nearly five feet of snow in the Snake Indian Pass. Anyway, I think this was just a few kilometers past Twin Tree Lake. I'm not exactly sure of the location, and I was coming out of some heavy bush and going on a slight downward slope toward a boggy area when I came across several large human footprints crossing the trail and going into the bush on the other side, heading toward the boggy area. It was probably near midday, and the weather was warm and sunny, and I was a little weary from the heavy hiking. The prints were very fresh, the ridges between the toes being still damp compared to the wetness of the rest of the print. The prints, despite the breeze in other parts of the trail, the prints had probably been made within the previous 45 minutes. They were very human-looking footprints, considerably larger than my own, with five clearly defined toes and evidence of toe movement and what appeared to be dermal ridges and cracks in the skin of the foot. They were hourglass-shaped, and very much larger than even the grizzly bear paw print that had been planted over my own fresh boot print a couple of days before. I took no pictures of these human-like footprints due to my incredible stupidity. For some reason, all I could think of was stupid park wardens walking around without boots in this kind of country. It wasn't until I had walked about another kilometer or two that it occurred to me how immensely silly my assessment of the prints actually were, and that I had probably been looking at very fresh Sasquatch footprints. That knowledge certainly put a spring in my step. 
to put as much distance between myself and the area that I seen the prints as possible. I saw nothing else unusual or uncanny during the rest of the trip. The terrain was heavy bush, breaking up into a boggy area. There were mountains all around. I have told very few people. On to the next one. In Alberta, approximately 150 to 175 miles north of Peace River, my ex-wife and her family were out in the area of Hag Lake. Her dad was driving a grader for the fire crews, building roads to access the fire area. There was not much to do, so they finished a lot at Hag Lake. This one day, Denise, her mother, brother, and nephew were fishing at one end of the lake when Joe, her brother, said, look at the bear on the other side. So, sure enough, they looked across and approximately 50 meters to one kilometer across, there was a large hairy thing walking on two legs and coming around towards them. They described it as being big, at least over six feet and moving quickly on two legs and not dropping to four legs at any time. The color is the odd thing. She said that it was gray and black in color. Anyway, it was moving too fast for her mother's liking, so they left and went back to their camp. That night at camp, Joe went to take the garbage back to the pit about one kilometer away and came back white as a ghost and took their dad back with him and showed him some huge footprints. On to the next one. Four friends, my brother and I, were hiking the Stanley Glacier Trail along the Alberta-BC border near the town of Lake Louise, Alberta. The day was overcast. We were walking single file with approximately 10 to 30 yards between each of us. My roommate was out front. Then, about 10 yards behind him was my brother. Then I was about 20 yards behind him. Then my three other friends, who are brothers, were behind me with their dog, as we were descending the trail, about two-thirds of the way back to where we had parked, there was a bit of a commotion up ahead of me around a slight bend, so I could not see what the commotion was. The small, yappy dog went tearing past me toward it, and the brothers behind me chased up ahead past me, trying to call the dog and keep it in check. I, on the other hand, was playing it cool thinking, big deal, there's a bighorn sheep or some hikers in the trees ahead or whatever. Nothing I hadn't seen before, so no sense running ahead in a panic. It turned out that something had crossed our path between the lead person and my brother, coming from the upward slope to our left, going across the path to the right, and then down the slope to our right and off into the trees. As I caught up to everyone, maybe a second or two behind the three brothers that had been behind me, and they were staring into the tree, and the dog was yapping. All I saw was a glimpse of something crashing through the trees. The dog stayed barking for a few seconds, then took off chasing whatever it was and yapping. During this, I had started to ask my brother what it was, since he was the only one that got a good look, as it crossed in front of him but behind the lead guy. My brother said some kid ran down from there and jumped across the path. He said it would have been around six feet tall, and he didn't notice any clothes, but it had a lot of long, kind of blonde hair, really long hair, all down his back. It must have hidden the clothes. All he could see was hair, no clothing. At this point, the chase with the dog and whatever it was chasing had ceased, and the dog's seemed to have treed whatever it was about 75 yards away. Then we started to hear the sound of what was definitely a tree creaking as if about to fall, but it would creak then stop, creak then stop. This happened about four times when we noticed we could see the top of the tree in question moving in time with the creaking. It was a still standing burnt tree further down the slope whose top was visible from our higher vantage point. After the fourth creak or sway, the tree finally crashed down. 
It was a substantial crash and seemingly a substantial tree. This freaked the dog's owner out as the dog went silent after the crash. They started rather frantically calling for their dog, but it took a good 15 seconds before the dog showed up or made any noise. When we realized that this thing had seemingly pushed over a tree, we thought it best to leave. My reasons for thinking it was something other than a human are as follows. The overabundance of hair. The lack of clothes. The leap across the path would have been difficult to accomplish for a person coming from the awkward spot he came on. The landing area from the leap was treacherous. My brother thought he leapt across and landed on a fallen tree trunk, sharp broken off branch stub, an even sloped footing, not to mention rounded and narrow. The apparent pushing over of a tree would seem to have taken a lot of strength. It was around 3 to 4 p.m. and overcast, but well lit. It was cool, maybe 13 degrees Celsius. A total of six of us, plus the dog, had been on a hike on a mountain trail and were on our way back down to head home, walking somewhat single file, but dispersed fairly far apart. It was damp out at the time and cloudy. There was still snow at the higher altitudes of our climb and hike, but not at the altitude where we saw the animal. There was a body of reasonably still water further back along the trail, which we passed probably 10 minutes earlier. On to the next one. My story happened many years ago, way before Glacier National Park was so popular. You could say back in the good old days, before it was discovered. I have no idea if these beings or Bigfoot or whatever. They were are even still in that country, given all the people that have come in since then. It wouldn't surprise me if they hadn't hightailed it to Canada and points north. I know I would. In fact, I did. Though I hightailed it more to the northeast, over to North Dakota, where I've lived for the past 15 years. It's harsh there in the winter, but I don't have to deal with a lot of people around. Anyway, that's beside the point, which is mostly that if this hadn't happened today, I would have immediately gotten a ride and never would have seen what I did. But back then, there just wasn't anyone around to give one ride. So, as you can guess, my vehicle broke down in Glacier National Park. I was a kid, all of 20, still wet behind the ears, as they say, and I'd managed to buy an old Dodge pickup for a few hundred dollars which was a fortune back then, at least to me. I talked the guy down a few bucks, seeing how the dang thing was all rusted out, but as long as it ran, that's all I cared about. I'd just gotten myself a job a couple of months before over in East Glacier, working as a grunt for the railroad, helping unload and load luggage and all that for the people who came to visit the park by train. There's a big hotel there. I can't recall its name, but it's a big deal for tourists. Very historic, built by the railroad in the 1920s. I remember now, it was the Glacier Park Hotel, now called the Glacier Park Lodge. It was quite the deal back when it was built with teepees and Blackfeet First Nations around the ground, all paid to create this Western experience for the dudes. Of course, by the time I came around, it was just another big old historic hotel that needed some updating, but it still attracted the tourists. I was living in Caliphell with my folks and younger sister, riding the shuttle bus to East Glacier on Sundays and staying there all week in a free room they gave us as part of my pay, though I guess it meant it wasn't actually free. I'd go back home Friday evenings for the weekend. I'd get homesick, see, which isn't what you're supposed to admit when you're 20 and supposedly all grown up. So I'd tell my friends I had a gal back there I was going to see. The truth was I missed my mom and her good homestyle cooking and my dad and his grousing at me and my sister always teasing me. Well, you get the picture. 
So it was a big deal the day I'd saved enough to buy my own vehicle. I could now come and go as I pleased. No more waiting around for a bus that was always late. I had wheels, and that meant freedom. Until the dang truck broke down, that is. And, of course, it couldn't have happened in a worse place. Logan Pass, at the top of the going to the Sun Road, or the Sun Road, as we locals call it. Actually, thinking about it, it could have happened along the road where there's no guardrail or at any number of places that would have been worse. So I guess I was lucky it happened at the top of the path where there's a visitor center and a big parking lot. It was, of course, late at night since these things usually happen at the worst possible time. I had to cover for my friend Matt who'd managed to get himself in trouble for being a little too obnoxious the previous evening. He'd actually thrown a chair through one of the hotel windows when some guy asked him to shine his boots or something. Matt really didn't belong in the service industry, as they call it now, as he had a problem being told what to do. But that's another story. So I'd covered for Matt doing my job and then his and it was probably around 11 in the evening when I topped over Logan Path and promptly broke down. My alternator going out, I could tell it was going from the battery gauge, but I was hoping I could at least make it to where I could coast down the west side of the path. Nope, no go. So near and yet so far. I was on the edge of the parking lot, but there was no way I could push that thing over to where it would start rolling. So I finally had to abandon ship and start walking. I think I used up every cuss word a 20-year-old knows and then some. Nowadays, you could undoubtedly hitch a ride even at that late hour. But back then, things went pretty much dead an hour or so after dark when everyone who'd been on the east side of the park made it back to the west side and vice versa. The park was abandoned by 10 and you had it all to yourself, barely even a ranger if you were dumb enough to be stuck out there. Or at least I thought the park was abandoned. I found out otherwise. So there I was, sitting all alone in my broken down old truck at the top of Logan Path at almost midnight. I sat there for a while, reconnoitering, trying to figure out what to do, though I didn't have many choices. Actually, I had only two choices. One, I could spend the night in my truck, uncomfortable, but fairly safe, and someone would come by the next day to help me out. For most people, that would be the logical choice. The other choice was to start walking, heading for civilization, which would be the Lake McDonald Lodge, which I figured was about 10 miles away. There was a very minor chance that I would meet someone who would give me a ride, but it was unlikely. So, being 20 years old and not very logical, I decided to start walking. It was all downhill, paved, I had a flashlight, and I could make a good three or four miles an hour and probably be down there in a few hours at the most. I had plenty of energy, was in great shape, and shoot, I could even jog along and save myself some time. It was a beautiful starry night with a half moon which with enough light that I actually wouldn't even need a flashlight. It would be easy to follow the paved highway. I gathered my small pack, got out and stood there for a while, letting my eyes get acclimated to the dark, then headed down the road. It was actually starting to feel kind of like an adventure. Well, it was an adventure, but not anything like I would have predicted. And it was an adventure i just as soon forget. And I later found out my estimated 10 miles to Lake McDonald Lodge was actually more like 20. When you're riding a bus, I guess you really don't pay attention because I'd been on that road dozens of times. But I ended up not having to hike it after all because I got myself into, how should I put it, a sticky situation. Now, before I go on, I should mention something you've probably already guessed. I was pretty cocky back in my youth. 
though this incident kind of knocked the wind out of me some. I would just jump to conclusions sometimes, though this particular night brought a little humility into my life, which was a good thing. Well, when I started down the road, it was at first kind of spooky being all alone out there. The sun road is carved out of the side of a huge spine called the garden wall, and it's narrow with hairpin turns and drops off the side thousands of feet. Some of the west side has a rock wall for a guardrail, but it's low enough that one could easily stumble right over. So I tried to keep to the inside wall as much as possible. It took a while, but my eyes gradually adjusted to the dark to that point. I could make out the stripe down the center of the road, which was a big help. Like I said, it was spooky walking along, sensing those immense depths just right beside you, hoping not to accidentally walk right off the edge. After a while, I kind of gotten a rhythm going, and it wasn't too long before I could tell I'd come to what called Big Bend, which is a turnout where cars pull off and stop to enjoy the views, though it was more often where people stopped to regain their nerve from driving the scary road. I knew I'd gone about two miles at that point, and I paused to look at the night sky, where more stars than I thought could ever exist all hung right there in front of me. Shining like an iridescent magic carpet, it was impressive, and I suddenly felt very lucky to be there, the only human on that mountain, as far as I knew. I was almost glad my truck had broken down, otherwise I would have probably never seen such an amazing sight. Looking back, I think this overwhelming feeling of awe was the reason I ignored another feeling that was seeping into my consciousness, one of trepidation and maybe even fear. If I hadn't ignored it, I think I would have at that point just walked right back up to my truck and spent the night there. Well, it is what it is, and I started back down the road, picking up my pace a little, feeling a little tenuous, and ignoring the fact I was getting scared. I probably walked another quarter mile when I got the feeling that something was following me. Now, Logan Path is famous for its mountain goats, sheep, and other critters, many of which are habituated to humans and unafraid. So I just figured it was something like a mountain goat checking me out and following me along. I can't say I liked that idea, but it didn't seem particularly troublesome. I stopped several times and turned around, hoping to see whatever it was, but it seemed like it, it somehow intuited my actions and would also stop. Had I actually heard anything? I wasn't sure, but if I had, it would be the sound of hooves, which meant it was a sheep or a goat. I hadn't heard a thing. I decided it was time for my headlamp as much as I didn't want to use it. I'd read that it takes a good half hour for your night vision to kick in, and using my headlamp would put me back to ground zero. But it occurred to me that it could be a bear, and I would therefore probably be wise to figure out what's going on. A bear's paws wouldn't make any noise, which would account for me thinking there was something following me, yet hearing nothing. I put my headlamp on when leaving the truck, so all I had to do was reach up and turn it on. It had a red light setting that was made specifically to preserve one's night vision, so I clicked to that and quickly turned around. There was nothing there. I turned the light back off and listened for the longest time but heard nothing. I decided I was just being paranoid, so once again continued back down the road. The thought of being followed by a bear wasn't a pleasant one, for most bears give humans a wide berth. Very few bears are predatory, so I hoped that maybe it was just curious, assuming that's what it was. I was now wanting to just get down to where there were other people around, away from what was becoming a feeling of vulnerability. I still refused to admit I was scared, though something didn't feel right. Being afraid wasn't part of my makeup, and the few times I had been scared, I quickly tucked it in and gotten over it. Now, all of a sudden, seemingly from nowhere, I thought I heard someone say something, someone behind me. This made me think, I can tell you, 
before it hadn't even occurred to me that maybe another person was following me. If so, why? Were they wanting to rob me? It didn't make sense. You don't pick random strangers walking down a remote highway in the middle of the night to rob. Well, maybe you do, but you don't follow them on foot. And who would be out in the middle of Glacier at night? I hadn't seen another vehicle at the path. Anyway, at that point, nothing made much sense. It was all so vague. I had a thick sense that I was being followed, yet I couldn't hear or see anything except for one slight noise that sounded maybe like someone talking, which was probably just a nighthawk. I was beginning to think I was getting paranoid, though I'd never been afraid of being alone in the dark before. But I just couldn't shake that creepy feeling. In fact, it was getting stronger. The further I walked, I stopped and again shone my light all around, but saw nothing. I could now hear the sound of running water, and I knew I was approaching the Weeping Wall, a place where water cascades down onto the road. Sometimes it's just a few trickles, and other times it's like a curtain of water. I'm not sure if it's coming down from some drainage above, or it's seeping from the wall itself, but as I got closer, I realized the wall was going great guns. The water was spraying clear into the middle of the road. As I approached it, my hair began to stand on end, and I don't mean that figuratively. It was literally standing on end, just as if I'd stuck my finger in a socket. I had a friend tell me one about climbing and almost getting hit by lightning, and he described his hair doing that exact same thing right before lightning struck, only a short distance away, literally knocking him off his feet. I have no idea why I reacted like I did, but I quickly flipped through the water and up against the weeping wall. Did I somehow think the water would be a good thing to deflect an electrical charge? No, I knew better than that, but if anything, it would increase the shock. I don't know what I was thinking, but in retrospect, I think I simply wanted to hide, but I didn't get shocked, and the charge seemed to go away. I stood there, wondering why I decided to get wet like that, ice-cold water dripping off me, thinking that my truck was now about three miles up the road, way too far to make a run for, and wondering why my hair would stand on end like that. Now, I saw something coming along the road in the moonlight. It looked to be wearing a dark cloak, for its head and shoulders seemed to flow together with no definable neck. It was tall, maybe a good seven feet, and like its neck, its arm seemed to flow into its body. I'm not describing this very well, but it looked like its arms were concealed by some sort of cloak it was wearing. The creepy feeling was really strong now, so much so that I wanted to run, and it was all I could do to stand still and be quiet. It was right by me, not more than 20 feet away when it paused. I was sure it had spotted me, but it continued on. I was now shaking, and it wasn't all from standing under a sheet of ice water. I wondered what I'd just seen. It didn't seem human, and yet, what else could it be? I waited, wondering if it was alone or if more like it would eventually come along. I had no idea what to do next. I couldn't just stay there hiding in the water as I would freeze to death. If I went back to my pickup, what was there to keep the thing from following? And even if I made it back to the truck, I had no defense except hiding inside it, and this creature looked like it could easily break a window or two. Should I continue on down the road, following it, hoping it wouldn't turn around and see me? I felt stuck. I then began assessing my other possible option. I could attack it, coming up behind it and using the element of surprise, crowning it with a big rock. I mean, it looked big and scary, but I hadn't even seen its face. Maybe it was old and not as strong as it looked. Or maybe I could cross over the low rock wall along the highway and hide, then wait for daylight. I did have a light, and I could use it to scope how steep it was. I tried to recall the terrain around the weeping wall, and all I could remember was that it was the side of a mountain, 
like the rest of the going to the sun road, and went straight off. I knew my odds of finding a place to hide were pretty slim. How about climbing the wall on the inside? Same thing. Sheer cliffs and hopelessness. I waited, getting colder by the minute. I knew I had to do something. Now, like I said, I could be kind of cocky, and for some reason, that cockiness kicked in. I stood there, getting colder and colder and madder and madder. I had done nothing to this person or thing, so why were they following me, scaring me, where I couldn't think straight? I stepped out from the water, wondering if I could ever warm up again, now soaking wet. Thinking about this made me even madder. I'd been minding my own business, trying to walk down to get help, and this creature thing had messed everything up. I was now no longer afraid, and I knew I had to start moving, or I'd start shivering again. So, without even thinking about it, I started jogging down the highway, once again heading for the Lake McDonald Lodge. If I caught up with the thing in black, well, so be it. Maybe I had a few choice words for it scaring me so badly. It didn't take long to get a hitch in my side, and I had to stop breathing heavily. After resting for a moment, I decided I needed to get a more reasonable pace going, slow down a little, and find a speed I could sustain. I started out again, this time much slower, just a slow jog, a pace I could probably manage for some time. It would warm me up, and I immediately began to feel better, like I had some control over things. That was, until I came around a corner and felt that strange charge again. This time, my hair didn't stand on end because it was wet, but I could feel it, like I'd run into an electrical field of some kind. It's hard to describe, but if you've ever gotten a mild shock and felt a little disoriented afterward, well, it was like that, a sense of uneasiness and disorientation. I could now see something dark against the inside wall along the highway. I paused, trying to make it up better. Was this the thing I'd seen earlier, or was it just a dark spot along the highway? Maybe the vegetation growing along the wall? As I got nearer to it, I could tell it wasn't vegetation, for it stepped out onto the road, as if it was going to try and stop me. Like I said before, I didn't like the way it made me feel. I guess scared would be the best way to describe it. Was this thing out to get me? I had no idea. I hadn't shown any such tendency, but I figured that was because it hadn't seen me standing there behind the wall of water. Because it was big and dark and mysterious. I just assumed the worst. And now, as I put on a burst of speed to run around it, I knew without a doubt it was going to try to grab me as I went by. And as this huge shadow stepped directly toward me, I let out a bellow that would raise the dead. I went running by, yelling at the top of my lungs, and it stopped and watched as I ran by like a banshee. In retrospect, it made no attempt to catch me or anything. It just stood and watched me go by. I was soon past it, unhindered, and then ran right smack into the low retaining wall along the outside of the highway. I almost caught myself, but then managed to go right over and down the side of the cliff. I'd been so focused on the shadow that I failed to notice that the highway curved. They say time slows down when something like that happens, but if anything, it sped up. I was over the rock wall before I even knew what was happening, falling through space anticipating the harsh end to my short life. A few seconds later, I landed with a crunch on what must have been a small ledge or even a rock sticking out of the mountainside. I hung there above what felt like thousands of feet of empty air. I could see a bush growing nearby, so I grabbed onto that. The wind knocked out of me, amazed that I'd landed where I did. After catching my breath, I realized I was uninjured, which was a miracle. I later went back and tried to find the exact spot where I landed, and I found a small ledge jutting out of the cliff, several bushes growing out of it, which had caught me and broken my fall. Talk about luck. The entire sequence of events seemed not just improbable, but impossible. Just a couple of hours before, I'd been merrily driving my pickup across the path, and now here I was on a ledge, 
hanging onto a bush for dear life, afraid to move. How could things change so drastically and so quickly? And if you've ever watched someone do something totally insane, like walk a tightrope across a gorge with no safety line, you'll know what I mean when I say my heart was in my mouth with apprehension. I could now see something dark looking over the edge, and I knew it was the cloaked thing. I again felt the electrical charge, and I watched in horror as it looked like it was assessing the climb down to me, both of its own legs, and hanging over the rock wall. I began yelling, no, don't do it, you'll fall, and other insane things, afraid it would come after me and knock me off my perch. I could now tell that I was only maybe 15 feet down, and it dawned on me, if I'd fallen any further, I would have been going too fast for anything to save me. But that 15 feet might as well have been a hundred or more, for climbing back up was impossible. I now heard a couple of deep thuds on the road above, and it occurred to me that the creature was collecting rocks to throw to knock me off. I can't begin to tell you the sense of dread I felt. I actually began crying. It again looked over at me, and I waited for it to throw down rocks, but it just stood there, watching me for what seemed like forever, not moving. It suddenly hit me how fatigued I was, which I later realized was primarily from the stress. I wanted badly to sleep, but I knew if I did, I'd fall. I stubbornly held on through what was possibly the longest night of my life. At some point, the creature left me, and I gradually began to see the faint light of dawn. I couldn't believe that I'd made it through the night, and I felt a sense of elation that since it was now daylight, I would soon be rescued. But that elation quickly turned to despair when it dawned on me that no one could see me down there, and there was no reason for anyone to stop and look over the edge. Not only that, knowing that going to the Sun Road, there wasn't any place to stop, even if someone wanted to. I could potentially hang there all day, and no one would know the difference. Though, I knew I actually couldn't hang there much longer. I now thought I heard the sound of a car coming in the distance. It was barely daylight, but I knew that tourists came out early to watch the sunrise and get a good parking spot on Logan Path. As there are lots of hiking trails there, I could hear it coming closer, and I wondered if it would hear me yelling as it went by though it seemed doubtful. I waited, wanting to time my yell just right, but to my disbelief, the car sounded like it stopped right above me. I could then hear a car door close as if someone had gotten out. I yelled and yelled as loud as I could, thinking maybe I was just imagining things and there was no one there at all until I saw someone look over the edge down at me. A voice said, what are you doing down there? Are you okay? I couldn't tell for sure, but somehow I knew it was a park ranger, probably coming to check everything out first thing in the morning. I was unable to say anything and just hung there feeling weaker and weaker. I could hear the crackle of a radio and I knew the ranger was calling for help. He was soon back over the edge telling me to hang on. That help was coming. It was probably another 20 minutes before I heard a siren and other vehicles coming. And I was soon being hitched into a harness and hauled up to the road by two other rangers who had roped down to where I was. It seemed impossible, but I was saved. They put me in an ambulance and wanted to take me to the hospital for an assessment, but I didn't want to go, so they took me to the park headquarters instead. After drinking some hot coffee and eating a couple of candy bars, I could feel my strength returning. My dad came and got me and took me home and he then hired a tow truck company to retrieve my pickup from the top of the path. A couple of days later, he and I replaced the alternator, and I went back to work. On my way back to East Glacier, I decided to stop at the park headquarters and thank them. Plus, I needed the answer to a question I had. When they asked what exactly had happened, I simply said I'd been walking in the dark and went off the edge, which was pretty much the truth, though I didn't tell them about the black creature. The thing I wanted to know was why the ranger had stopped where I was as if he knew I was there. He told me he hadn't known I was there at all, but had no choice but to stop because several large rocks had fallen onto the highway blocking it. And it was just luck, he said. 
as I drove my old pickup back up to the top of Logan Pass, I thought about what he'd said. I knew it wasn't just luck. It was, instead, the helping hand of something that I had badly misjudged, a dark creature in the night who hadn't meant me any harm at all, and who had instead helped rescue me, all while unintentionally giving me a gift, the gift of humility. It was 2009 when I saw a Sasquatch in Paulsbo, Washington. I went out there to visit my sister, who was unfortunately going through an ugly divorce. Her son was eight years old at the time, and I wanted to show them both a bit of support. I had been there for probably about a week, and I remember my nephew was wrapping up his spring break from school. It was when my sister went to go drop him off that I decided to capitalize on a beautiful day and take one of their old bicycles for a ride on one of the nearby trails. I found the most serene path that was meant to lead me to the bay. However, I wouldn't end up making it that far. I had probably pedaled three or four miles when I suddenly gasped at something so astonishing. I still have trouble putting it into words. Off to the right of the trail was what I initially thought was a very tall black bear, standing on its hind legs. Though I knew the size was far too large for a black bear, the color of its fur was too dark to belong to a grizzly. The confidence must have come from the fact I was indeed on a bicycle, but I managed to pull over and stare at this thing. Less than a second later, I deeply regretted pulling over to get a better look. I want to say the face looked more human than ape, yet there was something about it that reminded me of neither. It was like it was its own thing entirely. As soon as I made eye contact with this thing, it was like its presence entranced me. I remember its lips opening just wide enough to display two rows of chipped and crooked teeth. It was while it was showing its teeth that it unleashed this muffled hiss. Honestly, it sounded more like a purr from a household cat, but it was the curve of its brow that made it obvious it wasn't at all charmed by my presence. Even though I stayed focused on its face, I still recognized that it had an overwhelmingly muscular torso. Imagine Arnold Schwarzenegger in his heyday only much taller and covered with a dense coat of black hair. That's something that has always amazed me about this. Even with that much hair, there was still visible muscle definition. I'm not positive about how long I stared at this thing. It could have been a whole minute, but also a few seconds. It was when I returned both my feet to the pedals that the animal appeared to charge me. That frightened me so badly that I'm surprised I didn't bust the chain from the amount of sudden force I put into the pedals. Eventually, I did gain the courage to look over my shoulder. What was likely the most frightening part about this whole ordeal was the fact that I had to have traveled at least half of a mile before taking that opportunity. Yet the animal was in plain sight, watching me and ensuring that I was continuing to flee the area. I never would have guessed that this particular animal was capable of such speed, and the idea that it was able to remain on my tail for that long is outright frightening. How could something so large be so fast? To make things even more perplexing, the trail that I was on was fairly narrow, leaving me to wonder how it was able to maneuver its wide shoulders while maintaining my pace. After glancing over my shoulder at it the first time, I continued to do so a few additional times until I was confident that the animal was staying put. That provided me with a little bit of relief, but it was when the animal was completely out of sight that I began to hear what seemed like a symphony of spine-chilling noises. Not only did I hear a barrage of what I'd later learn is known as wood knocks or tree knocks, but also a plethora of what I can only describe as screeches and howls. There were so many echoing sounds 
that it was difficult to pinpoint the direction of which they were coming. Though I was pedaling fast, I frankly had zero clues as to whether I was pedaling my way into some ambush or trap. The bantering reminded me of what you would see from a pack of hyenas when watching the Discovery Channel. To me, there was something overwhelmingly sinister about the whole thing. By the time I made it out of the woods and onto the nearest road, I remember feeling a powerful sense of gratitude that I was still alive. There were a few moments that I truly thought I'd get marked down as another missing person and that I was going to put my sister into even greater turmoil. I believe it was a couple of years that passed by before I felt comfortable with telling my sisters what I had crossed paths with that morning, and she reminded me of how she accused me of seeming funny for the remainder of my stay. She then proceeded to tell me that she had a friend who claimed to experience something similar. On to the next story. I used to live a pretty normal life as a housewife back in Joplin, Missouri. However, that all changed shortly after my husband and I lost our only child to an accident that I'd rather not describe. Both he and I concluded that the only way we'd have a chance of being able to cope was to make some drastic changes in our lives. That's when we decided that he'd quit his job and we'd leave behind what we had considered a safe and stereotypical existence. As a means to escape, we rented out our house to a nice young couple and immediately purchased an RV. It was such an interesting change of pace for the two of us because it turned out that neither of us had ever ridden in one of those things before. I thought it was going to take some time, but it quickly started to feel as though we should have been living that type of life all along, even while our boy was still with us. It was truly the first time in my life I felt free from the shackles of society. It's interesting how it took a change of this caliber to get me to realize what I had been missing out on for the first 36 years of my life. We traveled all over the U.S. meeting all kinds of interesting people and eating a variety of food that I likely never would have tried if I hadn't been coerced into doing so. However, this adventurous life wouldn't come without a scare. Another thing that I should probably note is that we were in the second year of our travels by the time this disturbing event occurred. We were parked in a very isolated spot in the Yosemite area, and it was our third night in that particular location. Every once in a while, we'd come across a location that we both loved, and we'd sometimes stay for as long as two weeks when the scenery was beautiful and we weren't asked to vacate. I remember that it was midway through spring, though it was still a bit brisk in the air, especially during the night. It was around 2 a.m. when we were abruptly woken by the sensation of the rear end of our vehicle plopping into the ground. My initial instinct was that we had just experienced a minor earthquake or a tremor. But it was a few seconds later that we again felt the back of the RV rising above the ground and we could feel our body sliding down the mattress. Aside from our whispers, we couldn't hear a thing. We continued to lie there in total darkness, scrambling to come up with a logical explanation for what might be happening. But it was no use. It was as my husband tried to stand up on the now slanted floor that we finally heard which sounded like a very deep breath coming from a very large man. And it was right after that that the RV plummeted onto the rugged terrain. All of the windows were cloaked with blinds, making it impossible to see anything until one of us could peel them back. My husband always wanted to sleep without those things, but I had this nagging fear I'd wake up in the middle of the night and see someone staring back at me. I don't think I would have done the same thing, but my husband managed to stumble his way down to the steering wheel and slammed his palm on the horn multiple times. My hunch that this was a bad idea turned out to be correct, as the front of the RV was quickly raised, causing my husband to fall backward. It was as if whatever was doing the lifting 
knew that the noise would stop if it could move us away from the driver's seat. Fortunately for me, I was standing just in the front of the bed at this point, so the mattress there was to soften my fall. Nonetheless, that was when things started getting more intense. My husband was lying on the floor while it felt like the vehicle tilted past the 45 degree angle. It was beginning to feel as though we were about to be tipped over by the mysterious and significant force that lurked outside. I've never been interested in guns or any other kind of weaponry, but this was one of the moments where I questioned why I thought it would be okay to travel without protection. Recognizing that this was no earthquake, my husband began to yell at whatever was out there, somehow thinking that he'd be able to intimidate it with just his voice. Surprisingly, this did cause the RV to drop again, but it wasn't long at all before something started to slap against the outer wall. By this point, shards of various objects, such as wine glasses and mugs, were scattered about the floor, making things even more complicated on account that we had to watch where we stepped. My husband finally mustered up the courage as well as the balance to peel back one of the blinds and whatever he saw startled him so much he yelped and fell backward. Unfortunately, he ended up planting his heel into a large fragment of glass and let out another agonizing squeal. It was as I began to rush over and aid him that I saw the face pressed up against the small window. I only saw a glimpse before it fogged up the glass, but I have to say it was enough to stop me dead in my track. This is likely going to sound strange, but if you've ever seen the movie Swamp Thing, that's what this face sort of looked like to me, only covered in fur rather than sludge, or whatever it is the Swamp Thing is composed of. I don't recall its mouth being open at the time, so I'm unable to say whether if it had canines or any other sharp teeth. Its nose was wide and flat against its face, much like what you'd see on a gorilla. Honestly, I'm surprised I even remember those details, considering how petrified I was. Somehow avoiding stepping on anything sharp, I took two or three glances at our aggravator as I walked over to help my husband into his little booth that was on the left side of the vehicle. That was when I was able to hear the terror in his voice. He trembled as he spoke. What, what the hell was that? He said with muffled words. That especially freaked me out because he had never been one to get scared by much of anything. Suddenly, he seemed less like an adult and more like a scared child. As I returned my focus to the small window, the face was no longer visible to me. My husband was gripping his foot, so I flipped on the lamp that hung from above the booth. My eyes were immediately drawn to the blood that was already flowing from his heel, along with the piece of glass that was protruding from the thick layer of skin. Luckily, we had a pair of tweezers nearby because it wasn't all that uncommon for one of us to get a splinter while walking around barefoot outside the mobile home. It was as I was carefully extracting the glass that he gestured for me to become completely still. He had heard something else outside. Not long after that, I began to hear the bizarre communication that was taking place not too far off from the vehicle. It sounded like some kind of foreign dialogue between a couple of male hunters. I couldn't understand any of it, but I remember thinking that their tones were rather casual given the circumstances. I wanted to believe that someone had driven by at the right time, spotted the aggressor, and managed to scare it off before it could inflict any major damage to our home or us. However, a handful of strange animalistic sounds were woven into the dialogue, making it clear that we weren't the only humans in the area. My husband and I must have sat there in silence for 10 to 15 minutes before the voices eventually disappeared. Shortly after that, the ordinary sounds of nature returned. It is true how that happens when these mysterious animals are nearby. After treating my husband's foot, we remained in the booth, trying to get a bit of shut-eye while trying to remain prepared for the aggressor to return. Believe me when I say it was the longest night of my life, even when the sun finally rose. 
It was hours before either of us regained the courage to crack the door open to take a peek outside. Though there were a few imprints in the surrounding ground of the RV, none of them looked like much of anything in the photograph that we took. I did end up finding a pile of excrement somewhere close to the rear of the vehicle, and we even kept a sample of it and sent it to a laboratory for testing. Unfortunately, we never received a response. I don't prefer to be pessimistic, but I do have my doubts that the sample was ever examined. That's something I wish we would have put a little more thought into before making any move. Believe it or not, we continued to carry on with our travels, almost as if nothing had ever happened. Of course, we were both much more frightened than before, but I think it was more so the reluctance to return to a stereotypical life that kept us on the road. Even after all this time has passed, I still have trouble believing what happened that night. If it wasn't for someone else being there with me to confirm everything, I'm not positive I would have remained convinced. Though we do continue to enjoy the great outdoors, I can't imagine ever camping in anything as minimal as a tent. I have major respect for anyone who has run into these animals while tent camping and then regaining the courage to get back out there with nothing but a piece of fabric between them and whatever's out there in the wilderness. On to the next story. On July 22nd in 2005, Carla and I were out for a day hike in McCarthy State Park in my home state of Minnesota. The day was beautiful, with the sky being pure blue and not a single cloud was in view. We had just hiked around Side Lake and passed between both Elbow and Perch Lakes. We were beginning to pass through a somewhat open area on the northeast side of Perch Lake, heading toward the forest. I had noticed it first and pointed toward the location in the sky directly to our north. Both Carla and I were looking at what appeared to be a blurry spot in the sky. I know that sounds weird to you, but that's exactly what I had seen, and Carla saw it as well. Initially, I thought that something had gotten into my eye, but after I had rubbed it and still saw the blur, I asked Carla to look to confirm it in my own mind. Neither of us had any idea how far away what we were seeing was, nor did we know how big it was. It was like looking through clear oil swirling in the sky. Whatever it was had a distinct border to its shape, and it seemed to be moving closer. We stood there staring as this blur moved ever closer. We could see that it was a vortex of sorts, like that of water going down the drain, but we still had no idea if it was a mile away or a hundred feet. After about two minutes had passed, we identified that the shape was circular and we could also see the sky through it, albeit it was very blurry. It was only moments later that we could tell this blurry, drain-like visage was only about 200 feet away from us. I say this because this drain suddenly lowered in such a way that it was in front of the trees in the wood line ahead of our position, the trees being blurry as we looked through it. Where it was somewhat hovering, it appeared to be only several feet off the ground, and we could make out a distinct perimeter that was about 10 feet in width. All of this while this vortex kept swirling in on itself again and again and again. It was almost hypnotic to watch. I didn't quite realize it at the time, but the two of us had gotten very quiet, and we both started to walk slowly towards it, with neither of us saying anything. It was very strange indeed. It was as we were walking toward it, at what seemed to be a snail's pace, that we watched as a Sasquatch emerged from within the swirl. It stepped out onto the ground and walked away into the forest. Mind you, I just told you that we could see the trees through the swirl and that there was no Sasquatch visible, only leaves and branches. This Sasquatch appeared like a baby coming out of the womb, piece by bodily piece. It had emerged right before our eyes, until the entire creature was visible and on the ground. It was like it had been ejected by the swirling oil onto the planet. 
It was some five to ten seconds later that we saw a blink or twinkle of light and the drain was gone. The two of us were left standing there in an utter daze for what seemed like an hour before Carla simply said, let's go home now, and we did. We had discussed this weeks and months after the incident, with both of us in total agreement that something had happened to us that day. I was having a hard time thinking and putting the thoughts together. Even as it pertained to the simplest thing in life, I remember several nights standing by my nightstand, being uncertain what time to set my alarm clock for to go to work, as well as other things like what my phone number was and what way I went to work. In fact, one morning I sat in my car for almost 20 minutes, not knowing how to start it, which, by the way, was to put the key in the ignition. Carla had experienced the same sort of thing in her own life, and it wasn't until some six months ago had passed that everything had become normal again for the two of us. On to the next story. In the early summer of 2014, I took a trip to the southeast Oklahoma mountain region with one of my sons and a friend. We had been told of Sasquatch activity in that area and wanted to see it for ourselves. We settled in miles deep, passed the logging trails, and used that first day primarily to scout the area. We ran into a curious fox and a mother bear with two cubs that walked past our camp. We thought that if we made some noise, it might make these creatures curious, which might bring them closer in. So we set up some targets and fired off some rounds. Later that night, we heard what we could only describe as cat meows. Since we were in the middle of nothing but sticks, it just seemed too odd. We also thought we heard what we guessed to be rocks hitting small branches. It was as if they had been thrown. That evening and the next morning, all was quiet. Either that, or we slept so hard that nothing could disturb us. That day, a thunderstorm passed through, and the sound of the echo was amazing as it bounced through the valley. We hiked around a bit, but we didn't go too far due to the fact that we didn't know the area well. Light rain swept through all day. After a full day of searching, we hadn't seen anything. We retreated back to our camp, and after supper, I retired as the other two hung out by the fire. My friend brought his guitar and jokingly serenaded our hiding guest. I was again soundly asleep, only to be suddenly awoken by my son. He was trying to not act too excited, but was frantically exclaiming, We have eye shine! Dad, wake up! We have eye shine! I quickly threw on my boots without bothering to strap them grabbed my sidearm, and ran to where my compadres were positioned. We stood at the bottom of the steep sloping hill, and a light rain began. Approximately 30 yards up the slope, we could see occasional eye shine from behind a tree. We could also just make out what appeared to be a masculine shoulder and arm sticking out from around that same tree. My friend took aim and fired. In a flash, it looked as if the animal tried to grab the slug in midair, then it was gone. No sounds could be heard other than the firing of the gun and the light rain. Then, to the left, more eye shine shone in the darkness. Only this time they appeared orange, reflective, and far larger. They were almost the size of tennis balls. My son was standing next to me and suddenly yelled, Watch our six! He had night vision with him, so he was able to watch our sides and back. My friend said he was out of ammo and went back for more while my son continued his watch. What happened next still haunts me to this day. The creature charged us down the hill but stopped 39 yards away, grabbed a large bush and shook it wildly. Then it stopped. The bush was seven or eight feet tall and then it stood up behind the bush. I was struck with fear. I could clearly see the shoulders, neck, and head towering above the bushes. I had to remind myself to breathe. Silently, I drew my 40 and fired three or four times. My son turned around with his night vision and caught a glimpse of the creature running up the mountain. It was moving quicker than he thought possible due to the light rain and the steepness of the slope. At this time, my friend had returned fully loaded and 
we reported what had happened. My son also mentioned that he noticed what appeared to be blood in the foliage. We began to pursue what we assumed could possibly be a dead body, but we were quickly blocked by a cultural corral to our left, which stopped us in our track. We decided to stand there and wait. I think it may not be a good idea to walk up on an injured creature. After several minutes of waiting, we decided to climb the slope, but it was no easy task. We searched as we slowly ascended but found nothing. We returned to camp for a long, sleepless night. I was personally scared out of my wits that the creature would return. The next day, I decided we'd had enough, as I wanted to get my son out of harm's way. Even though he has had military experience, I still felt that I needed to do what I could to protect him. I have not shared this with very many people aside from close friends and family. Why would I fire on a creature, you ask? Well, it's quite simple. No specimens, no creatures. I believe these creatures are related to Gigantopithecus that cross the Bering Strait. I call them wood apes. But without a body, we have no real way to prove their existence. On to the next one. It was July in Miami County in Ohio. There is a river that runs past our aquatic center, which is a popular fishing spot for the locals. It was a warm day, so we decided to take a trip to the fishing spot. We were fishing on a trail off the path into the river, and I was about 15 meters away from my friend who was fly fishing. I looked up after catching a whiff of this horrid stench and saw a seven to eight foot tall creature with brown shaggy fur stand up and growl. Then I suddenly heard a tree fall behind us. We booked it as fast as possible to the truck. The next day we returned to the area and saw snapped limbs and the fallen tree, but we could tell that it was still green and alive when it fell. We believe there were more than one of the creatures, two to three based on how the tree fell. Also, I should mention that there were large paths that had been trampled into the ground that led from Deer Trail to other parts of the forest, which hadn't been there the day before. On to the next one. I grew up in the southern tier region of New York, specifically in Allegheny County. It is an area of farmland, forest, and is sparsely populated. There exists a local legend of Bigfoot with all the usual hairy woman nomenclature attached. The Klipnaki State Forest backed up onto our property and features both CCC planted trees and natural hardwood trees, making an area that totaled under 2,000 acres. There are natural limestone caves, creeks, dirt roads winding through the hills, and a large population of deers, game birds, plants, etc., my first experience with the hairy woman occurred when I was five or six. While picking wild strawberries with my mother, I had run out in front of her when I heard something heavy jump out of a tree. I froze. Heavy, slow footsteps could be heard heading in my direction. From approximately 200 yards into the red pine wood, terrified, I ran back to her and together we both headed home. In the years since, I've spent a lot of time hiking and camping in these woods. I would often hear the hairy woman treading lightly through the campsite where my friends and I camped many times. Usually more than one would come by at night. They would whistle quietly to each other as they traveled through. I'm not sure about knocks, but it is possible that I heard them. People in this area would talk about seeing and hearing them while hunting and driving through. Their existence was widely known and accepted, and there was never any negative talk about the hairy woman being dangerous. I remember that everyone just took this animal to be part of the wood, like all the other animals. The story ends with a night when I was 21 or so while out cruising around with a friend. We were out near an old gravel pit, which is about a quarter of a mile from the house I grew up in. It was late, and we were just quietly talking and dozing off when I heard what sounded like some heavy animal walking down one of the sides of the pit. 
I could hear stones sliding down and a sound that was the scariest and creepiest noise I've ever heard. It almost sounded demonic. We sped off without looking back. Years later, I wondered whether it could have been the same Bigfoot I had heard years earlier. In fact, we were only several hundred yards from where my first experience had taken place. On to the next one. Initially, after my first encounter, I was so shell-shocked that I now realized that I had developed PTSD from the event. During a rough three-year period after the first encounter, my wife and I had numerous unexplainable things happen to us at our home. However, I never thought to start documenting the event for future reference. It was only after speaking with a friend that I decided to take their advice and start keeping a journal. My wife and I are both college graduates. I have obtained a master's degree in adult education, and she currently has a degree in education with a minor in English literature. In my prior job, I was often called upon as an expert witness to provide testimony in high-profile criminal cases. We are both very aware of spinning tall tales and what it could do for our reputation. In the fall of 2008, my wife and I moved to rural southern West Virginia and built a small log home in a sparsely populated area. We have approximately 20 people living within a five-mile radius of us. Our property sits adjacent to a 13,000-acre wildlife management area, and in addition to the 20 acres of land we own, I also lease another 800-plus acres for hunting. In the summer of 2009, my wife fell extremely ill from a failed kidney. She was in and out of the hospital for several months during this time. After my wife had been released from the hospital to come back home, she was very weak and stayed in bed most of the time. During this time, our little girl was barely two years old, and our son was seven years old. My wife and little girl had laid down for a nap, and my son was in his bedroom, most likely playing a video game. I was sitting on our front porch, working on an electrical corn feeder head that had recently been torn up, when I heard a rather loud shriek coming from across the mountain on top of the ridge adjacent to our home. Both of my basset hounds heard the shriek and they began to growl deeply. Their fur bristled on end while they looked toward the mountainside. After a few moments of silence, I distinctly heard what sounded like a huge object crashing through the brush coming off the hill from the ridge toward our house. The sound was loud, but it was also slow and methodical. It was almost as if something the size of an elephant was walking in the brush toward me. The dogs continued to growl, and grew more and more unsettled. I stopped what I was doing and started watching the woodline, curiously. As the moments passed, the object responsible for the noise continued to get closer to our home. As it walked in a straight line off the ridge, I realized that at any moment I would be able to see the culprit responsible for the racket so long as it continued to walk in the direction it had been heading. I observed our dog, they had retreated from our yard and had attempted to hide themselves in a large hole in the hillside that ran alongside our front yard. The hole was there due to me uprooting a tree earlier in the year. Finally, I could make out a large, hair-covered thing standing on its hind legs as it stepped out of the woodline and looked straight at me. The creature was approximately 60 yards away from my position and was standing in clear view of me without any obstruction. That past spring, the local power company had contracted a bush-cutting company to clear out all the underbrush adjacent to the power line. The creature was standing in the clear-cut area. When I first observed the creature, I immediately attempted to process what I was seeing. My first thought was that it was a bear, standing on its hind legs. I further convinced myself that it made sense for me to be seeing a bear because I had two full trash cans sitting at the base of the hill near the road. This thought was further confirmed when the creature squatted down toward the ground because I convinced myself that the bear had sat down on its rump. After the creature squatted down, it became completely motionless. 
It was so motionless that it literally melted into its surroundings. Had I not been looking straight at the creature as it squatted, I most likely would have never seen it in plain view. After the creature sat motionless and observed me for several moments, I became bored with looking at the bear and went back to tinkering with the electronics I was working on. After a few minutes, I noticed movement in my peripheral vision. I looked toward the movement and I witnessed the creature stand back up. At that moment, I knew I wasn't looking at an odd-shaped, overground, dark brownish black bear. I was looking at what I thought at the time was a monster. The monster turned side profile to me while keeping its eyes locked on me the entire time. This was when I really got a good look at the creature, and then I knew without any doubt I was looking at a monster and not a bear. The creature was between seven and eight feet tall, with a thick chest and large, long arms. The creature's waist was thick, and its legs and hips were extremely sturdy and powerful. I could not make out any facial features because of the distance, but I could see the brow ridge and the eye socket as well as the oddly colored skin that didn't have hair. The monster proceeded to walk from my left to right while maintaining eye contact with me the entire time. It proceeded to walk a parallel line to my right for approximately 150 feet and it entered a pine thicket across the road from my front yard. The creature stopped as it entered the thicket. It proceeded to make the loudest, most guttural roaring howl I have ever heard, which could never be replicated by a human being. The roar reverberated throughout my chest and it literally felt as though it shook my porch. I began to panic and I imagined that the creature was going to attack our home. Suddenly, the creature let out the most ghastly, ungodly, moaning howl that could only be dreamt up in someone's worst nightmare. As the creature's howl started to taper off, I could hear a low growl emanating from it. I could feel the reverberations from the growl, and I grew weak at the knees as it sent a chill down my spine. I left the front porch area of our home and proceeded to arm myself. I thought of calling 911, but I realized that they might think I was either intoxicated or just a basket case. Needless to say, I could go on and on about events that happened after this initial incident, but let's just say I became afraid of going outdoors for quite some time. I am an avid hunter, but I became terrified of the woods after this. For the longest time following this incident, I had managed to block much of it out and forget about it. Gradually, after talking to friends and doing a lot of research, I was able to start regaining some normalcy in my life again. Only after I re-entered the woods and started hunting and fishing again did I fully remember the events that happened during this life-altering encounter. Obviously, I've had many, many more things happen since then, but this was the first time that I consciously realized what was happening to our family. Finally, I had an explanation for so many strange events that had been happening to us and our home since moving to the area where we still reside. Additionally, I became an instant internet junkie as I tried to find any and all information that I could on the subject of Sasquatch. The more I discovered, the more I realized I was experiencing the same things that many people elsewhere had reported happening to them. After my incident, I learned through some unofficial investigative work that there have been a multitude of sightings and encounters in the area for years. Some of the local names for the beast are the Red Eye or the Booger. Another popular name used by old timers was the Devil. Supposedly, they even found a nest of one of the devils back in the 60s. The place is still referred to as the Devil's Den. It is a large cave that is in the heart of the wildlife refuge. The Devil's Den is within two miles of my current residence. Coincidentally, there is a documented account of a local school bus driver who claimed that a creature ran off the hill on two legs and jumped from the hillside onto the roof of her bus. It happened while she was parked adjacent to the hillside while she was waiting to pick up kids for school. The driver claims that she heard something running off the hill and she exited the bus to see what the commotion was all about. According to the report, the woman claimed a werewolf-looking creature that was covered in hair and seven feet or taller 
ran on two legs down the hill and jumped onto her bus as she quickly re-entered it. The driver said she sped away with the monster still on the roof of the bus, but that she was uncertain as to where the creature finally came off the top of the bus. Needless to say, the lady went straight back to the bus garage and promptly reported the incident and then quit her job. The location where the lady had parked happened to be down the hill on an old dirt road just below the Devil's Den. On to the next one. In Roger Mills County in Oklahoma, the night before opening day of bow season, I arrived in camp at approximately 4.30 p.m. I began clearing an area to set up base camp for a total of three hunters who were joining me. I had been clearing out the area of Johnson grass for about 15 minutes when I heard a large impact sound approximately 25 feet to the north of me. It was way too heavy to be a deer. I stood there and heard three large impacts with a second or so in between sounds. The grass and trees were too thick to see any movement. I continued to work on base camp. I had forgotten my axe and had begun breaking wood over wood for the campfire when I started to hear rustling in the bush, again to the north of me. I also noticed movement to the south of me. This movement was different, and I thought it was possibly deer. Three to five minutes later, I began having the feeling of being watched, and it was starting to get dark. I made a fire and waited for the other two men to arrive. My friend, I'll call him R.L., arrived at around 8 p.m. We were sitting around the fire, and I noticed R.L. kept looking behind him and seemed uneasy. I asked him what was wrong. He said he had the feeling we are being watched. I had not said anything to him about the events of the evening. I told him that I had had a creepy feeling of being watched for over three hours. I was glad to have him validate what I had been feeling. The other hunter, M.R., arrived around 8.30 p.m. While we were sitting around the fire, we smelled a dirty, sweaty, skunkish smell that came and went. It seemed to emanate from the south. We called it a night. M.I. and I went into my camper. R.L. relieved himself in the woods and when he came back into the camper, he was as white as a sheet and had a shocked look on his face. I asked him what was the matter, and he said he'd seen eye shine. I didn't understand what the problem was and replied that it was probably a deer. He said, no, you don't understand. It's not deer eye shine I saw. It was large, red, and taller than me. I asked him about the possibility that it could have been a deer standing on a berm and he said no, it was all flat river bottom. The next morning, while I was in my tree stand, I heard three wood knocks to my west. About five minutes later, I heard a really loud noise, like a small caliber rifle going off, tree snap, and then the sound of splintering wood, like a branch was being ripped off. We met at base camp after the morning hunt, and R.L. was upset because he heard people talking down his deer trail. He couldn't understand what they were saying. He also heard a whistle. Late morning, the three of us were stock hunting, and I noticed something odd. I observed three red cedars that were bent over at the 8 to 10 foot level, all pointing to the northwest. No other cedars in the area looked like these. The next thing I ran across was something that looked like a nest made of small tree branches, nine feet long and six or seven feet wide, piled knee-high on me. This nest-like thing was underneath a hardwood tree. Beside the nest were two little shelters that were pup-tent shaped. One was three feet long, the other was five feet long, and were about two and a half feet tall. The grasses had grown back through the bottom of them. The leaves were dried out. It looked like whatever had made these things had not used them for six or seven months. I thought maybe some Boy Scout might have made them, but there were no string or twine to hold them together, and all the branches had been snapped off and not cut with a saw. I did ask the local Scoutmaster if they take Scout into the area, and they said no, they do not. I continued to hunt, and 150 feet away from the nest, I discovered a tree, 12 to 14 inches in diameter, was broken 
at the five-foot-tall level and leaned over against another tree. It looked level, like it was at a 90-degree angle, and smaller trees were placed against it. At first, I thought it was a windbreak for cattle, but it was too small, and the wind would go right through it. I looked for tracks of equipment because two of the trees were too large for a human to move, but found none. I had no idea what this could be. Later that evening, we were stock hunting again, and the sun was going down. I was northwest of camp. I heard what sounded like a guy calling cattle. This guy had massive lungs, possibly a quarter mile away, but at the end of this extended vocal was a loud whoop. The hair on the back of my neck stood up because it sounded apish. It repeated this vocalization another time. When I arrived back at base camp, I asked my friends if they had heard the sound, and they both had, and wondered what it was. At about 3 a.m. that night, I heard something being moved around and knocked over, but I didn't investigate it, as I was thinking it was raccoons. In my tree stand the next morning, I heard something mumbling south of me. It sounded like an Asian foreigner talking. I also heard two whistles south of me, down a deer trail. At 3 a.m. that night, I was jolted awake by a loud, human-sounding roar. It sounded like a combination of an African lion, the T-Rex from Jurassic Park, and a really pissed-off human. It was a deep, guttural sound. It was very angry. I could feel the sound vibrate in my chest. I think it came from the edge of camp. It roared again, same attitude. I could not believe my hunter friends did not wake up. Then, suddenly, from 50 to 100 yards away, came another sound. This was totally unlike the roar. It sounded like a female being murdered, but also incredibly angry. At this point, I woke up my friends and we waited, but there were no more sounds. I have heard mountain lions since I was six years old. This sound was nothing like what I heard that night. It took me an hour to go back to sleep as thought came into my head of the possibility that these things could rip the pop-up camper apart. The next morning, we went about looking for tracks. There was too much leaf litter, though. We came upon a huge plum thicket. As I came around to the southwest side, I smelled a dirty sweaty gunk smell like we encountered on Friday night. I felt we needed to leave right then, as I felt whatever made the roar the night before was in there, and we would be in danger if we stayed or pressed into the thicket. We packed up and headed home. I was uncomfortable and ready to get out of there. At the time, I had no experience with Bigfoot, and I only came to realize these events were Bigfoot-related when I heard an extended whoop vocalization. I didn't talk about this weekend with anybody for almost 30 years. On to the next one. My name is Chris B. and I'm originally from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I currently live in Texas. The story I'm about to tell you is 100% fact. My friend Alan and I had planned a fishing trip on the Canada River near his home for about a week, and decided to invite a few friends. The Canada River starts in New Mexico and runs through the panhandle of Texas all the way from the eastern border of Oklahoma. The other men were to meet us at the campsite. They agreed to set up camp before Alan and I got there. Well, Alan and I had gotten off to a late start. We managed to leave his house at around 11 o'clock that night. The campsite was only three miles from his home. Alan's older brother decided to tag along. We took several fishing poles, two lanterns, a 22 mag pistol, and a 22 pump rifle. By the time we had gotten to the site, the other fellows were asleep. So we rudely woke them up and told them we would be down the creek aways fishing. We went about 100 yards or so and found a small clearing that would do fine. Not long after putting the poles out did I notice something coming up on us in the woods from the opposite direction from where we had just come. Alan and his brother thought that I was hearing things, being a city fellow and all. 
What they didn't know was that I had spent many a day out at my uncle's place in the sticks near Hera, Oklahoma, and have heard the different sounds of the creatures of the woods can make. This creature was not trying to be quiet, and from the sound of the cracking tree limb, I could tell this creature was very heavy. Suddenly, the wind shifted direction, and we smelt a very foul odor. That is when Alan and his brother became concerned. They had hunted and fished in that area possibly all of their lives, and had never smelt anything like it. The creature continued to advance. Although the creature never came into our light, it did let us know that it was there, and we were not supposed to be. The creature let out a roaring yell that to this day sends chills down my spine just thinking about it. I immediately looked at Alan and his brother to see their reaction. They were so afraid I thought they would kill each other trying to get out of there. Trying to be as calm as possible, I told them not to panic and that we should leave together. Pistols at the ready, we headed out of the tent in a hurry. The creature confirmed we weren't hallucinating by letting out another roaring yell. Back at the tent, we rousted the other fellows and told them that they shouldn't stay the night. Of course, they thought we were joking around. We finally convinced them otherwise, and they reluctantly grabbed what they could carry and came with us. Halfway back to the car, as we were crossing an open field, the creature cut loose again with one of those roaring yells. At that time, the others agreed that this was definitely no place to stay for the night. Needless to say, it took several quarts of beer to calm our nerves that night. By the time we got back to Alan's house, we were feeling pretty good, but still anxious. When we told his father, he didn't believe us, nor did anyone else we told. The next day, we went back out to the site to recover left-behind belongings and to look for any signs of the creature. We couldn't find a trail, but we did find a large hole at the base of a tree and a four-foot-long tree branch that someone or something had used to dig the hole. I have kept this event secret until recently when I told my wife, children, and a few friends. On to the next one. This happened in McIntosh County in Oklahoma. The area was heavily wooded. We called them mountains, but they're more like large hills. The creature was standing in the middle of a gravel road on top of a hill about a hundred yards from a lake. The creature was large and hairy, long hair with no neck. I was building a deer stand overlooking a shell pit. When it started getting dark, we carried the scrap wood back to our tractor and trailer parked a short distance away on the gravel road, which led to our house and many others. We were parked on the top of a hill that leveled out at the top about 30 yards. As I loaded wood, I happened to look to my left, and there it was, standing in the road staring at us, with its arms held slightly out from its side. From where I was standing, it had Lake Eufaula as a backdrop, and I could see about two feet of hair covering it head to toe, blowing lightly in the breeze. At that time, my brother and I stood in amazement, arguing what this thing was. He said, do you know what that is? I said, yeah, it's a gorilla. That being the only logical animal that even slightly resembled what we were looking at. And my brother said, no, that's a Bigfoot. I proceeded to tell him there was no such thing. But I knew this was not a gorilla. It was just dark enough not to see facial features, but it was a perfect silhouette against the blue water. It was tall and stood upright. How tall? It's hard to say when you're scared to death. It had no neck to speak of, but lots of hair. But we didn't hang around too long before we turned tail and ran. We came back later for our tractor and trailer. On to the next one. Garen Kirk, 31, took a lot of solo trips into the woods as a knowledgeable and experienced outdoorsman. On December 3rd, 2014, he left home to hike the Mount Hood National Forest, and he planned to return on December 6th. On this occasion, however, he did not leave any details with his family members. His sister, Whitney Kirk Altman, reported Kirk missing on Sunday, December 7th, but the search was delayed until Monday, December 8th, 
since search and rescue crews couldn't be dispatched until the vehicle was located to determine a starting point. Originally from Milwaukee, Oregon, Kirk attended Portland Public Schools Vocational Village High School. For many years, he worked as an admissions representative at the University of Phoenix in Arizona. As soon as he returned to Portland, he enrolled at Portland Community College to study business. After transferring credits to National University, he completed his first term of online courses. Upon completing his bachelor's degree, he planned to pursue a master's degree. During his marriage to Kristen, Kirk was happy, but this soon ended and the couple divorced after several years and shared joint custody of their daughter, Gabriella, who was five years old. In the early morning of Monday, December 8th, a family member found Garen's gold Pontiac Grand Am parked in the parking lot of Frog Lake Campground off US-26, focusing the search in heavily wooded areas near the campsite. In addition to this, police were also able to locate his cell phone east of Frog Lake, heading southwest, after pinging it. In that case, he would have driven from Clackamas County into Wasco County, so the search was shifted to the Wasco County Sheriff's Office rather than the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office. The search for the missing person took place near Frog and Twin Lakes, which lasted for around nine days and was coordinated by the Wasco County Sheriff's Office with the assistance of approximately 170 volunteers. Also participating in the search were sniffer dogs and infrared detecting surveillance aircraft. It was mostly damp on the mountain over the period of the search with temperatures slightly above freezing and snow levels unusually low for December on the mountain. Search and rescue groups participating in the search for Kirk included Multnomah County Search and Rescue, Pacific Northwest Search and Rescue, Lake County Search and Rescue, Clatsop County Sheriff's Office, Clackamas County Sheriff's Search and Rescue, Wallowa County Sheriff's Search and Rescue, Clickitat County Sheriff's Office, Mountain Wave Emergency Communications, Salvation Army, Trauma Intervention Program, Zigzag Welches and Sandy, Bud's Towing of Oregon City, the Milwaukee Presbyterian Church, and volunteers from several businesses in government camp. Garen was not found despite the effort of search teams. The fact the cell phone was pinging in the direction of Clear Lake from the area south of Frog Lake was strange, but search efforts seemed to be focused on the vicinity to the northeast in the area of Twin Lakes, which is unusual unless the media reported the location incorrectly. Brian and Annette Kirk continue to keep Garen's memory alive to this day by maintaining the Facebook page in loving memory of Karen Kirk. On to the next one. Thomas Tom Branch McAdams, aged 67, went missing. Friday, September 23, 2016. He was headed for a hike near Horsetail Falls in the Columbia River Gorge area when he was last seen. A report of his disappearance came in on September 26. His vehicle was found at the trailhead to Horsetail Falls in the Columbia Gorge parking lot on that day. The Horsetail Falls are part of the Columbia River Gorge in Oregon. The waterfall is located right next to the historic Columbia River Highway, so it is easily accessible. It resembles a horse's tail because of its shape and the rounded rock face over which it flows. The creek has two waterfalls. There is a footpath that leads to the upper Horsetail Falls, also known as Ponytail Falls. Originally from Hartford, Connecticut, Tom was born on November 20th, 1948. Tom and his three younger siblings were raised in Bloomfield, Connecticut, after his parents moved there shortly after Tom was born. Summers were spent learning how to sail and eating lobster on the coast of Maine as a child. Throughout his life, Maine has been a special place for Tom. From 1967 to 1971, 
he studied at Kenyon College, majoring in religion. Despite not being religious, Tom disagreed with the war and the draft. Tom drove out to Portland from his hometown in a Volkswagen van around the mid-1970s, then began studying nursing at Oregon Health and Sciences University in 1979, completing it in 1982. Tom began working at the Oregon Burn Center at Legacy Emanuel Hospital in 1978, where he spent the next 38 years as a Burns nurse. In January of 2016, Tom retired from the burn unit. Tom was active, healthy, and loved the outdoors even when he was in his 60s. An avid skier, both downhill and cross-country, he also enjoyed sailing and canoeing. But hiking was his favorite pastime. Since moving to Portland, he has climbed Mount Hood, Mount Adams, Mount St. Helens, South Sister, and Mount Katahdin in Maine, and hiked the trails of the Columbia Gorge numerous times. His wife, Cynthia, and daughters, Brittany and Alice, were his closest friends. With gray hair, green eyes, bushy eyebrows, and a mustache, he weighed 165 pounds and stood 5 feet 11 inches tall. Several of Tom's recent signs of memory impairment, some personal issues were reported by the Portland Police Department after he went missing. Additionally, he didn't bring any hiking gear, which concerned Portland Mountain Rescue spokesperson Mark Morford. He said, we're searching the waterfalls, looking around the base of the falls, looking in the pools, but there have been no clues. We always worry when a hiker is out that doesn't have the stuff to survive the night. We really encourage hikers going out to have the minimum gear to get through the night. To help search the area around the falls, Morford's group sent nine searchers divided into four teams. Officials were optimistic because temperatures in the 60s would be able to help McAdams survive. Dave Jenkins was hiking in the area at the time of the disappearance. He remarked, It's beautiful, and they've got well-developed trails there. I hike by myself sometimes, and I've always thought a lot about what if I have some trouble. In the hours between midnight and 2 a.m., dogs were sent in to search for scents. On the first day of the search, search and rescue crews headed to the area at first light after the plane got a credible hint in the Nesmith Trail area, but no sign of Tom was found. Around 150 people searched over 200 miles of trails in the Columbia River Gorge to find him, but without success. Upon hearing of new information, the authorities announced that they would resume the search when credible news leads were found. However, these credible news leads never materialized. Since Tom disappeared in 2016, no trace of him or his belongings has been found. The fact that he was experiencing some personal problems was a factor, but he seemed to have been a happy family man with two daughters. As he had not taken any equipment with him, it was clear that he was planning to hike for only a few hours. However, something unexpected happened. As of yet, the mystery behind his disappearance remains unknown. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day. So be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!